How's it going, everybody, and welcome to episode 217 of Master My Garden Podcast. Now, this week's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by garden designer Adele Fieri, and we're going to come at it from a slightly different angle. So we've had garden designers on in the past, and we've talked a lot about their style. But today, we're going to talk about Adele's style, but we're also going to you know, talk about the things that you can look out for as you're maybe starting to think about your own garden, whether that's get, getting a garden design or whether that's putting your own stamp on it. So we're, we're sort of coming at it from a different angle. We've lots of you know points that we want to get to, and it's going to be very interesting for anybody who is you know starting a garden in the earlier stages or is maybe looking to add some features in the garden. So Adele, you're very, very welcome to Master My Garden Podcast. Morning, John. Thanks for having me. It's no, d- delighted to, to have you. Thank you. Uh, so you're you're uh, having started your business a couple of years now. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what has brought you from, you know, where you are to to becoming a garden designer. Um, yeah, I suppose um, I'm no spring chicken coming into this. I've um, I grew up in a farm, John, um, from County Offaly, and uh, it was kind of like a tillage farm and vegetable farm. So I was always kind of surrounded by kind of not so much gardening, but uh, that type of lifestyle. Yeah. And um, yeah, so and it's not something gardening. My passion for gardening grew as I've probably got a bit older. Yeah. Um, and especially, I suppose, when you get your own house, which was probably 2003. And then I had an opportunity to, you know, kick on and do my own little garden. But, you know, that was a small urban garden. So I kind of outgrew that and... Then we came out here. I'm just living outside Clarence Bridge, and there was great opportunity with this site. And um, yeah, so I kind of just been working at my own garden for a number of years here. And I suppose like everyone during COVID, it was like, you know, you were so focused on your garden. And then it was like people have been saying to me, you know, Italy should be thinking about doing this professionally. And I went, <laughs> OK, yes, and put a lot of thought into that. And uh, yeah, so there and then at that point, it was like it was probably putting up a few posts on Instagram and people were enjoying what I was doing. So I was getting a little bit of feedback, positive feedback. And uh, then I I had a sister who's in business and she said to me, Etel, uh, you kind of need to do you have a qualification. So that was it. Um, so yeah. I um, two years ago, then I took off up to Dublin and I did a garden design course. Brilliant. And yeah. So, and so how, how has it been? So you're 18 months, two years uh, up and running yeah. now. How, how has it been? How have you found it? Yeah. So I suppose um, the course in itself was an eye opener because there's so much more to garden design than just planting. So yeah. <laughs> I have learned all about the principles of garden design and how to build a garden from construction and what all the landscapers do. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, so there was a lot of learning to be done. And, you know, when I finished the course, I was really delighted to get up and get going and having new clients again, there's a lot of learning with that too, because you're not, you're no longer just working in your own garden and, um, setting up your own business. It was my first business kind of that I've been setting up on my own. So it is enjoyable, but I think, you know, I've learned that you kind of have to take it slowly, not to take on too much on board um, yeah. for now. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, so congratulations on completing the course and getting getting up and running anyway. Thank you. Um yeah. it's 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 always at any stage of anyone's life, it's a it's a it's a big it's a big undertaking, but you seem to be taking it and making great strides forward. So well done with that. Um as I say, we had some discussion points that we were going to talk about, you know, all around gardening. The first thing that, that strikes me, yours, your your business has developed from uh, your own personal passion and your own development of your garden outside Clarenbridge. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure when you were designing your own garden, you had a sort of a style or a team that that you like, and that's probably unique to you, is... Is that the sort of style you carry through into your business or do you think that it's a case of, you know, speaking to the clients and developing a style that suits them? How, how does that sort of marry across? I think I'm lucky. When I when we arrived here, um, this garden was 
very much that whole naturalistic look to it. It was never a designed garden by the previous owner. Um, so around the garden, we have a lot of lovely hawthorn um, and, you know, it has stone walls and the style of planting. I was always probably working with kind of slightly woodland edge that kind yeah. of a garden yeah. style. So, um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's been lots of trees that I've worked with in my garden, Hawthorn, and very it's very natural here. And I think that's the way garden design is kind of moving. You know, people are obviously very aware now they want to bring nature into the garden mm -hmm. and bringing in trees is very beneficial. So, yeah, what I have here, I think, is very much what's developing in other people's gardens. Yeah. Yeah. So it so. has been yeah a natural a natural sort of transition then because yeah. very much so they um yeah it's just the style of planting here there's a lot of native plants and trees you know you you've got um you know you've got you it's, it's primarily like a lot of hawthorn and that and you know um crab apple and you know I've brought then other you know I've kind of worked basically from that kind of canopy down to um looking at what i can make easy maintenance throughout the garden so mm -hmm. yeah so that in itself has um been nice it's like you have a lot of um woodland type planting throughout very yeah. good mm. uh, if someone is starting you know they're, they're they're in their new home which is where as you said you developed your your slate bug for gardening. I think most people uh, would find that they they get into their home, then they look to develop a little patch and it becomes successful. And then eventually they catch the bug as well. It seems to be, it seems to be something that happens almost everybody. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people. Yeah. So where, where would you advise somebody to start, you know, maybe to avoid mistakes to the sort yeah. of, I think, John, um, and sometimes, you know, to design a garden, you're almost better off to start when you meet your architect designing your house, you know, you're getting your house together. And if you can, at that point, even engage a garden designer um, about the garden and, you know, the garden designer at that point would be just giving you advice on the spatial planning and the layout, you know, and that's exactly what you want, you know, um, it's important that you get that right from the start, that the layout of the garden and that you're not making big mistakes um, and putting things like the patio in the wrong area or the garden shed taking up your lovely sunny spot in the garden. So I would say if you have an opportunity um, when you're designing your house, get your interior designer. They probably do that anyway for inside, but, you know, your garden designer, it's good. And it might be just a consultation. That's all you might just want. And it's just to get the layout and the spatial planning right. You know, that's important. Um, sometimes you find that it's when the build is complete and then the client will ring you and say, oh, my God, they're, they've decided now they ha they'll do the patio for us. And when the client is put under pressure, you know, then you can kind of make hasty decisions and probably it's rushed and you won't get as good a finish as if it's more planned and, and thought out, you yeah. know. I think that's yeah. really good advice in terms of, particularly in terms of, you know, self builds or new builds. Um, you know, some people obviously don't have any choice around orientation and so on if they're if they're moving into a, a housing estate or a housing scheme. But um, if you're doing a self build or, you know, a one off house and you have input into orientation of house and all the rest of it, it's engaging with a garden designer in that early stage, as you say, even if it's only for the, the basic consultation of what should be we be looking out for here. I think that's. A very good yeah. point. Yeah, I think some people, you know, might feel they haven't got the budget at that time for the garden design. And obviously they're putting all their money into getting their house together. But, you know, even if it's just that consultation, just to get the spatial layout right. And then, I mean, that's what I would have done with some clients so far. And it's very much the design will, 
you know, they'll come back to me then when it comes to hard landscaping, which will be the next part of it, you know, and we'd look at how they, the types of finishes and and the, the style, right? And then, you know, it might be two years time before it gets to actually the last part of the design, which is the planting, the furniture and the planting. But, you know, it can all be done in stages. So the big thing is, is to get your, you have to figure out your, your site orientation, you know, have a vague idea of where things are going initially. And and then from there, your house gets built and then you can you can develop out your plan after that. Yeah, absolutely. And to figure out the orientation, you know, some people might realize you're very much looking at the sun, you know, and yeah. where does the sun shine? And, you know, if you want to have a nice, if you want to use your garden in the morning, well, then you would like an east facing um, area for your you know you're seating catch the sun in the morning and then as the sun as the sun progresses during the day you know you might decide that that that's going to be a good sunny spot or you might prefer a shady spot for your dining area and then you know if you just prefer to be out in your garden in the evening and you want west facing sun for your you know the for evening entertainment area yeah, yeah. so it's just to lay it out according to the orientation of the sun yeah and, and on a practical yeah. level that makes such a difference because we have our sort of outdoor dining area or barbecue area, let's say, and mm. it gets all the evening sun. So it's getting the sun from three o'clock literally until it disappears. So it's a perfect yeah. spot for evening. But yeah. you, you sit there in the morning with your, with your coffee at any time of the year and it's cold because it's actually getting completely shaded. And yeah. the way it is, there's a little bit of a wind comes around it. So it's, it, it's not at all nice to sit for a coffee in the morning. So yeah, we've just created another little spot at the back, which basically is get, getting full sun in the morning. Now, we yeah. might not get to sit out there too many days, but the days we do, it'll be nice and it'll be warm. It'll be sunny. Um, yeah. And that's what we'd encourage is just to try and find if you have an opportunity, if you have you know enough space in your garden to try and uh, find a couple of different areas. It's not just the, the patio area to try and find um, a place that you can actually go in the morning. And if you can try and encourage uh, a little bit of moving around the garden, you know, and that can be done with seating areas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, so someone has, you know, engaged a, a garden designer as a consultation at the start, and now they're looking at their their garden and where to get started with actually creating a garden. What sort of tips would you be given, you know, to, to get started? To get started. And um, so they, they have they, they lay out done, is it? When they so have assume, the layout done. Assuming they've got, you know, a reasonable handle on the orientation and, and they've got that right. And, yeah. and now they're starting to, you know, maybe develop or create a garden. Yeah. Yeah. So once the zoning is done and once they've decided on, um, I mean, they'll obviously have a wish list as well of, things that they would like to bring into the garden. And sometimes I find you just have to advise your client that, you know, it, it has to, your garden may not be able to accommodate absolutely everything that mm -hmm. they want on the wish list, right? So it's being practical about it and um, deciding on what your garden is able to is capable of, you know, what you're able to achieve in that in that space. Yeah. Um, so after that, once you've all that figured out, then it kind of moves on to the hard landscaping and deciding on materials, you know. So again, you know, say your natural stone finish, like a limestone finish or whatever, uh, for your patio. Um and then it's only when you have all the hard landscaping and that uh, decided on, then you kind of look at the planting. So, I mean, that's the, it's lovely. Some, some, some clients I find they're very interested in the planting and maybe they make a mistake of buying a certain amount of plants for the garden and, you know, trying to figure how to bring it into your garden um, can be difficult. So if you get the hard landscaping finished, then you know exactly where your planting areas are and what type of plants are more suited for the specific areas of the garden. You might your garden might be in shade. So again, that at that point, then you'd be looking at planting for shade. Yeah. So it's um yeah. There's probably the there's the getting the layout right, getting the hard landscaping materials together and then working on planting. Okay. And so 
from from your perspective as as a garden designer, if someone mm -hmm. is you know has this idea in their head, are they better to you know roughly sketch out something uh, and and draw up a wish list of what you know the family wants from the garden, and then come to you with that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I suppose it's important. A tip I've learned is not to be a complete yes person to all the clients' wishes because, like, sometimes you know that what they're looking for, it's not achievable in their garden. So again, you just have to look at exactly what they're looking for and try and um, decide on the best option for them. Yeah. yeah. So you might be saying no to some things as diplomatically as possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, some Something springs to mind and it sort of leads me to the, the next point we had on our list of, of to talk about. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday about garden designers and specifically there was a couple of garden de designers that came up in the conversation and how this person loved their designs to a certain extent, uh, but asked me the question, how would, how much work would be involved in maintaining that garden after they'd walked out? So <laughs> it, it was an interesting one because they are, it wouldn't be my style of garden design and that that we were talking about. Um, yeah. But this person particularly liked a garden designer. And, mm. but for me looking at it, there would be a huge amount of garden maintenance going forward in almost all of the gardens that I see uh, being created by this designer. And I thought that was, it was something I hadn't really thought much about previously, but I think that would be a consideration for people as well. Am I right in saying that? That Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, most clients will say to you, oh my God, I don't want um, too much maintenance. Yeah. Mm. So, um, I mean, you look at trying to reduce the maintenance, obviously, and make it as, as easy maintenance as possible. But like, you know, a lot, in my opinion, if, if that's the case, then you don't bring the whole garden together full of perennials you know mm -hmm. you would actually be looking at maybe a higher percentage of shrubs flowering mm -hmm. shrubs nice variety of shrubs and trees nice small ornamental specimen trees and you know i would be um i would be a good advocate for ground cover planting so you know that's a great way of making your garden low maintenance so if you're putting in predominantly shrubs well then you just make sure you have a good planting of ground cover beneath it and say for example in this garden um you know there's a lot of evergreen euphorbia it's a brilliant ground cover plant you know and it works really well um so yeah so i would be saying we we we'll go with a, a planting scheme where there will be you know, maybe two thirds shrubs and maybe one third perennials, but the shrubs will always be underplanted with ground cover, you know, and even okay. the perennials you choose, like I would be choosing stuff that's going to clump out, that's, it's going to, it's, you know, over time, it'll all knit together. Um, and I suppose at the start, it's important to mulch the beds after the planting is done because it takes two to three years done for the whole uh, planting scheme to knit together and yeah so for the first couple of years you'll be informing your client to look when this is when this is um, planted up it'll be nicely mulched and you know it will get easier as the plants mature yeah yeah, no, I just thought it was interesting because this person is is in the process of looking for a garden designer and they were asking, you know, about these designs. And I just asked her how much time she had to spend in the garden. And she said literally none. So yeah. um, so someone wants this garden delivered as it as it looks, but they have no time to spend in it for the next couple of years. So yeah. it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a jungle of weeds and it's yeah. not... No, I, you can pick. It's like even with the perennials and that. Like there's um there's a lot of there's a lot of good plants out there that don't need much work. You know yeah. um 
And that's the important thing is just to choose that a good variety of hard working plants and um and not I suppose not to plant it too skimpy, you know, yeah. not to be leaving too much bare ground from the start, you yeah. know. Yeah, for sure. Uh you you mentioned ornamental trees there. Um, what's your kind of go to ornamentals at the moment? Uh, I know it's different for different yeah. size gardens, but, you know, is there any that you're kind of using a lot at the moment that yeah, you really well, like? I suppose, John, this this time of the year, it's all about blossom and bulbs. Yeah. Uh, spring is a fabulous time. Um, and it's 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 quite easy this time of the year to choose nice trees, ornamentals. And um, I mean, you have lovely crab apple trees. Um, I particularly like Malus Everest. Um, okay. It's a beautiful tree, lovely blossom. And um, it has all year round interest. Well, you know, maybe for three seasons anyway, because um, it produces beautiful crab apples. Crab apple then that sees you through the entire winter. The birds don't seem to to eat them apples um, so much. Um, so, yeah, Malus Everest is a lovely one. I like Amelanchier. Um, I mean, that's kind of a stalwart in the garden design industry. Um, it's a lovely uh, spring blossom great autumn colour um, and you know you know you have other trees like if you can choose maybe small multi-stem trees that might have a nice bark and um, such as like a uh, prunus cerula um, acer grissium something in the winter when all the foliage is gone you have a nice bark structure and that that in itself can be nice uh, a nice interest architectural as well yeah yeah brilliant. And you you mentioned uh, ground cover planting, and you did mention uh, euphorbia, evergreen euphorbia. What 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 else are you using there as your as your ground um, cover? Yeah, well, the evergreen euphorbia is a great one. Um, it depends on the soil type. There's another lovely one, Pachysandra, um, that kind of likes more of an acidic soil. Um, yeah, I mean, even geranium, you know, there's a lot of geraniums that are kind of semi-evergreen um, that I would use in planting schemes. And they look well even throughout the summer then with if you have like roses and other kind of uh, nice summer summer planting scheme um yeah there's um there's there's other um uh, ones like kind of like more woodland like sweet woodruff um yeah i would use um 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 alcamilla mollus that's a lovely yeah. one so kind of a, a nice lime green uh flower in it uh, this there's kind of plenty to choose from but it depends then on your soil type and if it's yeah. dry or if it's moist you know those... yeah, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. um we, we spoke about planting for year-round interest and i think this mm -hmm. is especially in in a garden that maybe somebody has done themselves they they go into their garden center or their nursery at a particular time of the year and they buy everything that looks nice on that day and they put it into the garden um so it looks well at that time of the year every year but maybe they're not getting the the sort of spread across the seasons yeah so any any tips for you know planting for year-round interest which yeah and that's the problem and it's particularly this time of the year people will go um, um oh my god i better i want to get the garden going so they go out and then start choosing a load of plants that will look good from now until maybe june july you know yeah. but um so to to plant for year-round interest really you know that planning it's best, it's almost best to start planning your garden in the autumn. And you kind of sit down and you go, look at how many seasons have I to try and to get through. So you have in the autumn, I'd be planning. So what's going to give me interest in the winter time, you know, and again, something like a nice um, ornamental tree with good bark structure. Um, also, what's going to keep the garden going in the winter? Do I have enough structural plants, evergreen planting? You know, so that would be that season that you have to think about. And people do seem to forget about the winter interest, you know. Um, and then into the spring, you know, you'd be looking at, you know, your blossom and your bulbs. The bulbs can carry you through in the garden, John, for, you know, almost from January right through until June, you know, yeah, if, yeah. It's, if it's well thought out. And... There's you nearly need to break the summer into early summer and late summer. You know, a lot of people find the garden can be it's hard to achieve that lovely um, planting scheme uh, throughout the late summer. You mm -hmm. know, so I would be very much 
planning a lot of my garden planting to perform from say June right through until September. And that would be late flowering perennials. And then for the autumn, then you have to think about what's what's going to interest me then. So ornamental grasses are a great, you know, one to go to. And again, some of the late flowering perennials then that are going to hold on to their seed heads and they're going to look interesting in the late autumn coming into winter. So it has to be planned. Do you know, you're better off nearly to sit down in the autumn and decide there's 12 months of the year here. We have three to four seasons and this uh, every month pick four, you know, choose four or five plants or shrubs or trees that are going to give me interest. And you work the whole way from the autumn right around through every month of the year. And you make sure you've you're covered, you know, that's how you kind of get the the year interest. Yeah. Going. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's it's a really good point, I think, is that while you know, obviously there's four there's four seasons, but in terms of flower and flower interest, you could probably stretch that out to maybe six, you know, because yeah. you have your, your winter, uh, early spring, late spring, early summer, main summer, yeah. then late summer, autumn. Yeah, so you, yeah. you have all these kind of windows and yeah. a lot of the time you do see, you know, peaks and troughs of, of interest. So you're saying map those out as kind of six segments of the year. Absolutely. And a lot of people find it easy to get the garden going in the spring because they, you know, the, there's lots of bulbs and early in the summer. It's lovely. You've got, you know, a whole range of plants um, aquilegias, you have salvia you know, Nepita roses. And then it's just come July, August, it's like, oh my gosh, um, it's all kind of gone over. So, you know, you might be, you know, if you're clever, maybe around the end of May, you can do the Chelsea chop on a certain amount of the perennials. And then that could create a later flush of flowering or a second uh, flowering um, later on in the later summer. Yeah. So um, as Christopher Lloyd said, if you can plant, if you can consider the planting from the latter part of the year, from June onwards, you know, that's will give you um, a good a good planting scheme for the garden you know the planning for yeah. the later the later part of the year yeah yeah for sure mm -hmm. uh yeah and it's interesting when you see uh, get certain gardens and they look brilliant at a certain time of the year and you know they have been planted at a certain mm -hmm. time of the year uh, but it's also if you look at certain gardens you'll know it was planted x amount of years ago because all the plants yeah. that are in it are the plants that are in, in vogue at that time um yeah. I think over the last couple of years, I think there has been more of a, how would I put this? It's very obvious from, from 10, 15 years ago that the planting was done from 10 or 15 years ago and it will, it will look that way. But I think at the moment, over the last few years, the planting styles that people have been using, the, the mixture of you know, perennials, ornamental grasses, uh, flowering shrubs, flowering trees, it's going to be a little bit more timeless, I think. The... Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, all of that type of planting creates a lovely sense of movement in the garden. And um, there's a lot of nice, like, transparent planting that, like the ornamental mental grasses and the likes of nice calyctrums and some quite tall plants, but, you know, they're... They're nice. They create a nice kind of an airiness in the, in the planting scheme. Um, but you also have to get the structure right, you know, make sure that you have a good uh, percentage of, you know, evergreen structure in all the beds. And then you can knit in this lovely naturalistic planting scheme into the beds to, to follow. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned ornamental grasses a couple of times. What, uh, what are your kind of go to ornamentals at the moment? Yeah, well, I suppose um, some of my favourites would be the miscanthus. I like miscanthus morning light. Um, I like the, some of the steeper grasses, steeper gigantica. It's a lovely grass. Um, and then, you know, you have, um, there's different varieties of um, grasses. There are other grasses that I use, like Hakanakloa. That's, and that's a lovely ground cover um, grass as well. 
Um, but yeah, there's a good range of miscanthus, um, calamagrostis, that's a lovely tall grass. Um, it does well throughout autumn, keeps its um, structure well into the winter. And, um, you know, these grasses can give you a great, great level of interest um, in the garden until up to around February, John. Yeah, so you'd be putting them back maybe February and um, they'd be, you'd be relying then on bulbs and, and other plants to, to get the spring going. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Garden lighting, we you mentioned in in the points. So garden lighting done well can look can look brilliant. What's your your kind of tips around garden lighting, or what kind of garden yeah, lighting? Yes, to not to overdo it, John. Um, so garden lighting, it's important. I suppose there's two different types of garden lighting that I would focus on, and that would be like uh, the wayfinding lighting. So that would be the lighting that will be important for lighting up, say, your pathways, your patio areas, maybe either side of your driveway, um, either side of your front door, you know. So there are the, the lighting that will help you to move around the garden when you, yep. when you need your lights on. And then the other type of lighting is uh, feature lighting. So, you know, if you uh, had a lovely specimen tree and you want to see that even from your inside your house at night. So it's just a, a little like an up light or a spike light will, you know, give off a lovely, uh, it's it's nice to up light something like that and to see the, can you know, to see the structure of the tree. Yeah. Um, so lighting is important. And, you know, some people are in their house and, you know, if you have this black abyss, you know, if you're looking out, if you can't see out the window and it, it avoids all that. If you put on lighting in your garden um, and then you just light up something like a sculpture or um, an ornament tree, um, you know, it's just, it, it kind of keeps the interest going, you know, in your garden, even um, especially in a long winter's evening when, you know, get start very early <laughs> yeah and yeah and, and that's precisely it in the winter time when it gets dark early it can feel like you're locked in and not connected at all to outside but by lighting up that garden a little bit it adds a little bit of a connection and especially if you have something like as you said earlier the multi-stem trees you know a a, a nice multi-stem jack monte or acer grisium or you know something like that and you have an up lighter on it it really does it means that there is still another world out there. You're not just uh, locked into your house for the winter, yeah. Yeah, and just that you know, that, you know. So if you have your wayfinding lighting, and then if you have your feature lighting, you might want to use them at different times. So that's important in the in the whole design that they would be put on different circuits, and that your lighting would be, you know, to be able to turn on and off your lighting, that you can do that from inside the house, you know, and that you'd have. If you only want to use a feature light when you're sitting in at night, then, you know, you have this, a separate switch set up for that. And, um, yeah, just to be, I suppose, economical about it. Yeah, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. um, talked about trees as well. And you mentioned that, you know, woodland is, is you're, you're quite strong on the woodland team. Uh, but we spoke about teams for our trees for privacy. What are you kind of what are your go to trees there? Are you talking about, you know, standard trees or? Yeah. yeah, well, I think, John, you know, it depends if it depends really on your garden or you if you're in an urban garden and, you know, if you're surrounded by a lot of houses and you really need privacy screening um trees for privacy. um you know, so in that situation, you might be looking at putting um pleach trees into um, a garden yeah. uh, for a client. And, you know, you might probably need an evergreen. So a pleached evergreen tree would be, it's like basically a stem, a tall stem and like a hedge on, on, to on top of the stems of the trees. So um, it's to create a screen. Uh, it might only be one or two meters above the wall, the surrounding wall of the person's garden. But you might, um, you know, it will give them the privacy they need all year round. So, yeah. I mean, this is something you can you can choose. Probably if there's a big problem with um, a private needing screening, you look at evergreen um, peach trees. And I suppose the go-tos would be um Crocus ilex is a lovely one, although it's a little bit hard to get your hands on it now. 
um, then you have holly can be a lovely peach tree, something like um, Nelly Stevens, um, and Ellie Agnes, and um, even some forms of privet, Japanese privet, um, can provide um, a nice uh, effect. Yeah. Um, but then if you're in the country and you're looking for privacy, I'm kind of looking at even just the deciduous trees, um, you know, um, if you have a big garden, you know, you're realistically, you know, you probably just, you're going to be using your garden in spring, summer, into the autumn. And, you know, if you choose a good variety of nice deciduous trees that are going to come into leaf early in the spring, um, that in itself will do its job. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mm. Um, you mentioned planting out tips. So... What what's what's your when we spoke about it again a little bit already, but you know, what's your tips for say planting out? Uh how many per meter are you saying that you should be planting to get your know, good cover? Or what's what's your your kind of rule to thumb around things like that? Oh yeah. So I suppose um in that in that situation you want repetition, you know, that's important in the border, John, that you repeat, you you choose a certain variety or number, uh, a certain number of uh, plants, um, plant types, and then to see it repeated along the border is 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 good good garden design, um, and to avoid avoid it being completely uniform as well. Um, like you'll always, it's always nicer if to have a little bit of slight randomness to the to the planting bed. Um, you will be planting in groups. It is important um, to group the plants together. But um, yeah, so that it's it's um, a little bit, you certainly use repetition, but a little bit random as well, you know, that um, it doesn't look too, too um, made up or, you know, it's... Yeah, a little bit artificial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I know it depends on the scale of the planting area, but when you're saying uh, multiple plants, are you planting in trees, fives? Uh, yeah, uh, you generally, yeah, generally you would to create like a, a nice drift of planting. Yeah, so you could be planting in even bigger groups, you know, you, some, you know, you could have um, seven, nine, eleven plants. Yeah, it depends on the size of the planting bed. Um, yeah, and you pick, you might select maybe four or five different types of plants. And yeah, you would generally go maybe three, five, seven and repeat them down along the border. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Your thoughts on on bamboos. So I know you mentioned that you had listened to the podcast with with Peter Stam on bamboos. Um. But just your thoughts on bamboos generally as a garden designer. Do you use them? Uh. Do you like them? Or what's your what's yeah, your thoughts? Yeah. You know, and I actually I met I bumped into Peter after that in um Carrow Hurley Nursery, and um yeah I just felt after listening to your conversation on bamboos I always liked bamboo. Clients are a little bit apprehensive, um, worrying about them taking over the garden. But no, they're, I like bamboo and I think bamboo looks really well if it's planted um, in even in amongst ornamental grasses in, in a design. I think I love bamboo. It adds a little bit of movement in the garden sound which is very important as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and not to be afraid of bamboo. I mean, there are some that are runaway varieties that you would never, um, ever consider. But there, if you choose kind of clump forming varieties, um, they are, they're, you know, they're, they're really nice, very worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just to go back to the woodland, woodland planting now, um, so you mentioned that woodland is a big part of your team. So just give us an idea of woodland. So you're using a tree first, and then you're probably layering down into sort of woodland shrubs, maybe woodland bulbs. Yeah, give us a so, sort of combination for your woodland planting as an example. Yeah, so even here, just out in the garden here, so my trees say I have, um, I have um, say the hawthorn, right? Um, and what I've done is um, beneath that I have, a lovely, lovely structure of um there's ferns, um, there's bruneras, there's some lovely um hydrangea. Um, yeah, so a lot of plants that are kind of happy in a little bit of shade 
um, they do very well in the garden here. So, yeah, so I have, um, and then there's a lot of um, nice shrubs as well that don't mind the, the, um, the bit of shade. But that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, the type, the style that I have, yeah. Yeah, and it's always a, it's always a nice. Do, do you have in that little area? Do you, are you able to walk through that, or is that sort of a closed off area? It's an it's an always a nice area to be able to sit in and and walk through as well. So, yeah. So in the garden here, I'd have kind of created a lot of informal little paths, you know, and uh, the paths might be just little gravel paths going through. Um, and yeah, just to have a little seating point um along the way, and it might even be just like an old like a log or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that actually works. Yeah. Very good. As we start to round off, um, maybe just tell tell people where they can find you or if there's any other sort of main tips that you would give someone who's who's looking to looking to get started with their garden. Obviously, you've mentioned, you know, engage a garden designer early, just even for the basic information. Or then if they're at the point where they have all their orientation figured out to do a proper plan. So maybe... Just give your your sort of tips around that. Yeah. The process is get it get in touch. Then you have do you have a meeting, a Zoom call, or what way do you do it? Like do you talk through, you know, what they're looking for, and then and then uh, sort of come up with a plan based on that, or yeah, how so how does the process I, work? Yeah. So basically, yeah, you either have a conversation over the phone, but sometimes I call out and just to meet the client and have yeah. a look at their garden, and take it from there. So yeah, so you decide then what they want. You know, they might want a full garden design, or they, they they may. Um, and yeah, so from there, then you you kind of break it up into maybe creating a concept drawing for them, and that will give them an idea of how the garden should be laid out. And um, it might be a full garden design then, where you'd be talking about starting with the concept drawing done, and then moving from there into like giving them another drawing, a working plan drawing. Um, that's something then that they could. Uh, give to their the landscape builder and then to complete the garden then they get a full garden planting plan so it gives them, it gives them all the the plants and that can be planted up in different stages you know yeah. by the yeah brilliant mm -hmm. uh, there's been loads of really good tips in there i think and you know some nice plant plant combinations but especially really good really good tips as to you know how to go about things how to think about things and how to think about your garden designs and and your planting and so on. So, um, Adele, it's been a really brilliant chat, and wish you the best of luck with uh, the business, you, which is still mm -hmm. at a relatively young stage, I guess. But yeah, uh, yeah, they're really, really the best of luck for it. And where can people find you? So you mentioned Instagram, or how yeah, do people absolutely. get in touch? Yeah, so it's Edel Theory and it's F E I G H E R Y, Edel Theory. And uh, yeah, you'll find me on Instagram or on um, email. Yeah. Brilliant. And your email address is? It's edel.theory at gmail.com. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so, Edel, it's been a great chat and thank you very, very much thank for coming you. on Master My Garden podcast. That's great. Thanks very much, John. <laughs> So that's been this week's episode. A huge thanks to Del for coming on. Um, as I mentioned, some really, really practical tips there, some good ideas, some, I suppose it makes makes sense of thinking about the garden as a 12-month garden. And as Adele said, drawing out those sort of maybe six seasons uh, and then filling plants into that. And then obviously making sure that they suit your garden, right plant, right place, and, and that sort of thing. But by doing that, then you're creating a garden that has interest all year round, as opposed to, you know, going out and doing something and then it looking good at a certain time of the year. So you're getting that year round interest. And that's really important. We spoke about it on the podcast before where we might be looking at plants with autumn interest, but we're doing that several months beforehand. And so then when the autumn comes, you have this little surprise, this little pop of color um, that gives you true, gives you color through the, the autumn and winter. So, yeah, really great tips there. And uh, that's been this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And until the next time, happy garden.